Of all the shocking and macabre experiences of my life, the one that I shall longest remember occurred a few years ago in Paris. Like hundreds of other young Americans, I was then an art student in the French metropolis. Having been there several years, I had acquired a fair speaking knowledge of the language, as well as an acquaintance with many odd nooks and corners of the city, which I used to visit for my own amusement. I did not foresee that one of my strolls of discovery through the winding ancient streets was to involve me in a dread adventure. One rather hot and sultry August evening, just as twilight was softening the hard stone outlines of the buildings, I was making a random pilgrimage through an old part of the city. I did not know just where I was, but suddenly I found myself in a district I did not remember ever having seen before. Emerging from the mouth of a crazy twisted alley, I found myself in a large stone court opposite a grim but imposing edifice. Four or five stories high, it looked like the typical medieval fortress. Each of its four corners was topped by a round tower, which, with mere slits of windows and pointed spear-sharp peaks, might have come straight from the Middle Ages. The central structure also rose to a sharp spire, surmounting all the others. Its meager windows, not quite so narrow as those of the towers, were crossed by iron bars on the two lower floors. But what most surprised me were the three successive rows of stone ramparts, each higher than the one before it, which separated me from the castle and the musket-bearing sentries that stood in front. Strange, I thought. I've never run across this place before, nor even heard it mentioned. But curiosity is one of my dominant traits. I wouldn't have been true to my own nature if I had not started toward the castle. I will admit that I did have a creepy sensation as I approached. Something within me seemed to pull me back, as if a voice were crying, keep away, keep away. But a counter voice, probably some devil inside me, was urging me forward. I fully expected to be stopped by the guards, but they stood sleepily at their posts and appeared not even to notice me. So stiff and motionless they seemed that a fleeting doubt came over me as to whether they were live men or dummies. Besides, there was something peculiar about their uniforms. In the gathering twilight, it was hard to observe details, but their clothes seemed rather like museum pieces, almost what you would have expected of guards a hundred years ago. Not being challenged, I kept on. I knew that it was reckless of me, but I passed through a first gate, a second, and a third, and not a hand or a voice was lifted to stop me. By the time I was in the castle itself, and saw its grey stone walls enclosing me in a sort of heavy dusk, a chill was stealing along my spine despite the heat. A musty smell, as if from bygone centuries, was in my nostrils, and a cold sweat burst out on my brows and the palms of my hands as I turned to leave. It was then that I first heard the voice from above. It was a plaintive voice, in a woman's melodious tones. Sir, sir. What is it? I called back, almost automatically but the chill along my spine deepened. More of that clammy sweat came out on my brow. I'm sorry to own it, but I had no wish except to dash out through the three gates, past the stone ramparts, and onto the known safe streets. Yet within me, some resisting voice cried out, Jim, you crazy fool, what are you scared of? And so, though shuddering, I held my ground. Will you come up, sir? The voice invited, in the same soft feminine tones, which yet had an urgency that I could not miss. Frankness compels me to admit that there was nothing I desired less than to ascend those winding old stone stairs in the semi-darkness. But here was a challenge to my manliness. If I dashed away like a trembling rabbit, I'd never again be able to look myself in the face. Besides, mightn't someone really be needing my help? While my mind traveled romantically between hopes of rescuing maiden innocence and fears of being trapped into some monstrous den, I took my way slowly up the spiral stairs. Through foot-deep slits in the rock walls, barely enough light was admitted to enable me to stumble up in a shadowy sort of way. Nevertheless, something within me still seemed to be pressing my reluctant feet forward, at the same time as a counterforce screamed that I was the world's prize fool and would race away if I valued my skin. That climb up the old stairway seemed never-ending, although actually I could not have mounted more than two or three flights. Once or twice, owing to some irregularity in the stone, I stumbled and almost fell. Here, mister, here, the woman's voice kept encouraging. 
and if it hadn't been for that repeated summons, surely my courage would have given out. Even so, I noted something a little strange about the voice, the tones not quite those of the Parisian French I had learned to speak. The speaker apparently had a slight foreign accent. At last, puffing a little, I found myself in a tower room, a small chamber whose round stone walls were slitted with just windows enough to make the outlines of objects mistily visible. The place was without furniture, except for a bare table and several chairs near the further wall, but what drew my attention, what held me galvanized, were the human occupants. So as to see them more clearly, I flashed on my cigarette lighter, at which they drew back in a wide-mouthed, startled sort of way, as if they had never seen such a device before. But in that glimpse of a few seconds, before I let the flame die out, I clearly saw the faces, the fat, stolid-looking man with double chins and a beefy complexion, the alert, bright-eyed boy of seven or eight, and a girl of fourteen or fifteen, and the two women, the younger of a rather commonplace appearance, but the elder of a striking aspect, almost regal in the proud tilt of the shapely head, the lovely contours of the cheeks and lips, and the imperious flash of eyes that seemed made to command. "'Oh, sir!' she exclaimed. "'Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.' All at once it struck me that there was something unutterably sad about the tones, something unspeakably sad, too, in the looks of the two women and the man, something bleak that seemed to pervade the atmosphere like a dissolved essence, until I caught its contagion and felt as if the whole world's sorrow were pressing down upon my head. Now, as never before, I wanted to flee, but something held me rooted to the spot. I was like a man in a dread dream, who knows he is dreaming and yet cannot awaken. Repelled and at the same time fascinated, I watched the elder woman approach with outflung arms. There was, let me not deny it, a seductive charm about her glowing femininity. Although she was no longer young, I took her to be somewhere in the nether years just beyond thirty-five, there was something extraordinarily appealing and sweet in the smile which she flashed upon me, a plaintive smile as of one who looks at you from depths of unbearable suffering. At the same time, there was something that drew me to her, held me spellbound with a magnetic compulsion. I could have imagined men easily and willingly enslaved to that woman. Sir, she pleaded, and for the sake of convenience, I give the English equivalent of her words. Sir, they have ringed us around. What are we to do? In the name of the good Lord, what are we to do? They permit us not even a newspaper, sir, rumbled the heavy voice of the man as his portly form slouched forward. They stand over us all the time. We have no privacy except in our beds, put in the younger woman with a despairing gesture of one bony hand. They inspect all our food, every bit of bread and meat, suspecting it may contain secret papers, the elder woman lamented. Worse still, our doors are all locked from outside. We can hardly move a step without being trailed by a guard. We cannot read, we can hardly think without being inspected. Oh, was ever anyone tormented with such vile persecution? Was anyone ever tormented with such vile persecution? The second lady took up the cry, in a thin wailing voice that sent the shudders again coursing down my spine. As if by instinct, I was backing toward the door. I wondered if I were not the victim of some frightful hallucination. But what do you want me to do? I blurted out, as with one hand I groped behind me for the doorknob. Do? What do we want you to do, sir? groaned the elder woman. Speak with them, plead with them, beg them to treat us like human beings, not like beasts in cages. But who am I to speak to? Who are they? What do you mean, madam? Who but our persecutors, our oppressors? Who but our persecutors, our oppressors, echoed the other woman with a ghostly repetition of the words. By this time it was so dark that the five persons made but shadows indistinctly seen against the dungeon-like gloom. There was no arguing now with my fear. It was taking command of me. The next instant, had the man not surmised my thoughts by some clairvoyant perception, I would have left the dolorous strangers to their fate and dashed pell-mell down the tower stairs. Hold, sir, his voice detained me. It is growing late. We need a light. And then, with startled eyes, I witnessed one of the eeriest, one of the most inexplicable incidents of all. Suddenly, though I had seen no lantern, there was a light in the room. It was a sort of grey-white phosphorescence, midway between the hue of a light fog and that of pewter, and it seemed to come from nowhere in particular, 
but filled the room with a fluctuating radiance, at times bright enough to reveal every object, at times permitting everything to sink back almost into invisibility. By this illumination, all things, even the man's beefy face, took on a ghastly pallor. My own hand, outstretched in a gesture of spontaneous horror, startled me with its pale spectral quality. Do not be afraid, sir, one of the women spoke reassuringly. They will not find you. The guards were sleeping, else you could not have come up. You were heaven sent to help us in our need. My knees quivering beneath me, I did not feel heaven sent to help anyone. In that uncanny wavering light, which struck my disordered imagination as almost sepulchral, I was more frightened than in the darkness. I was just a little relieved, however, to see how the small boy, curled up near the wall with some straw for a pillow, was sleeping in apparently normal childhood sleep. Nevertheless, I had found the doorknob and was drawing it toward me. A blast of chilly air, contrasting weirdly with the heat of the summer evening, swept up the tower stairs. A second more and I would have been gone. But the elder woman, crossing the room like a flash of light, had placed herself next to me, between me and the door. I could see her big sad eyes, not a foot from mine, glowing as if from immense hollow depths. I could see her long, pale, proud face, alternately brightening and darkening, by the flickers of the changeable, unearthly light. And once more she exercised that strange, that magical compulsion upon me. My limbs were frozen. I could merely stare and wonder. "'It is not for our own sake, sir,' she resumed, in a voice that shook and wavered even more than did the light. "'It is not for our own sakes that I beg your aid, but for our poor innocent children. For their sakes, in the name of heaven's mercy, go out and plead with our oppressors, sir.' Rush forth, rush forth and summon help, before it is too late. Before it is too late, came a low sobbing echo. But you, who are you? I demanded, growing more mystified from minute to minute. We? Who are we? Is there anyone in all Paris that does not know? Is there anyone in all Paris that does not know? There sounded a sobbing refrain. But they seemed not to hear, or at least not to believe my denials. Look at me, do you not recognize me? The man demanded, thrusting his face within inches of mine. Who in all the land could help recognizing me? Observing the round, commonplace features, the paunchy cheeks, the sensual lips and dull eyes, I failed to recognize anyone I had ever known. Ah, sir, you must be a stranger in the land. I, yes, I'm a stranger. From California, I managed to grasp at a straw. From where, do you say, sir? he asked, as if he had never heard of my native state. And then dismally he went on, half to himself, Am I then so changed by my hardships that I cannot be recognized? No doubt I had a different look in the old times, when I went forth daily in the hunt. Yes, that was a sport worthy of a king, chasing the antlered stag, a sport worthy of a king. And I, bewailed the elder woman, her eyes downcast, her whole form seeming indistinctly to sag, Perhaps I also am changed. Oh, how changed from the days when I led in gay revels and frolics, and banquets and masked balls, and was merry the whole day long, and the whole night long, too. Little did I suspect in those old happy times what a bitter blow was in store for me. Little did I suspect, moaned the second woman, little did we all suspect. Had I chanced upon a band of lunatics? Was this old tower the hospital where these poor deranged wretches were kept? This seemed to me, all in all, the most plausible solution. Nevertheless, it did not explain the weird light, which still pervaded the grim round tower room from some unseen source. Nor did it account for various other incidents, which I report even now, with a tingling sensation along the spine, and a numbing clutch at the heart. It may have been only the wind, but the door, which I had opened slightly, suddenly closed with a dull thudding jar. Yet how could it have been the wind, since the door opened inward, and hence a breeze from below would have pushed the door wider open? And from inside the closed room, how could an air current originate? But I was sure that no hand, and least of all mine, had touched the door. Even as I struggled to regain my composure, I reached again for the door handle, more determined than ever to leave. But as I did so, my shaken nerves were shattered by another shock. With a series of high-pitched yipping barks, a small creature ran out as if from nowhere and began cavorting about my knees. Where had the little dog come from? I was certain it had not been in the room before. 
I was equally convinced that there was no way for it to enter. By the flickering grayish-white light, it had a sort of half-solid appearance as I reached down to pet it, and somehow I was not quite able to place a hand upon it. Eluding my touch, it ran over to the elder woman, who bent down and caressed it. And then, as suddenly as it had come, it was gone. But from someone's throat, the adolescent girls, I believe, there burst a spasm of uncanny, hollow laughter. Then, as I pulled at the doorknob, the elder woman was again at my side, her lovely sad eyes fixing me with a stare of such terrible intensity that I was gripped powerless in my place. My hand dropped from the doorknob. For the first time, I knew myself to be a prisoner. "'What is to happen to us, sir?' she lamented, not hysterically, but with an air of dignified restraint beneath which I could feel the hot passion smoldering. "'What is to happen to us all?' Time after time we hear the alarm sounding below us on the streets. We hear the crowds shouting, but we can only guess what it all means. Can you not tell us, sir, what it means? Can you not tell us, sir? echoed the younger woman. I shook my head helplessly. Ah, sir, you are like them all, the first speaker sighed. Like the guards, like that monster who has charge of us. You know, yet you will tell us nothing. You know, yet you will tell us nothing, came the unfailing repetition. I feel it in my bones. A worse fate is in store for us, the woman moaned, while one pale hand moved significantly across her neck. My sainted mother, who was far wiser than I, foresaw it all long ago. But then I was too young and giddy to listen. Now that she is in her grave, sometimes at night I can see her before me, warning, warning. Warning, warning, took up the other woman. Come, come now. Things are not always so bad, are they? The rumbling voice of the man broke out in incongruous, soothing contrast. We have no complaints about many things, least of all about the food, now have we? At noon, we have three soups, two entrees, two roasts, fruit, cheese, claret, and champagne. It is not all we have known in our better days, sir, but it is not bad. It is not bad. Then the boy and I, on fine days, are allowed to walk in the court below. You can walk there, but not I, broke out the elder woman, who was evidently his wife. You can submit yourself to the staring insolence of those beasts of guards, not I. You can console yourself with your fine meals, not I. I think of the fate that is in store for us all. I think of the future of our poor children. I think of the future of our poor children, came the inevitable echo. The boy, slumbering against the wall, chose this particular moment to turn over in his sleep and moan. I, for my part, would have left then and there, had this been possible. But even if I had not already been riveted to the spot, I would have been held by the woman's anguished cry. Think of our friends, our poor friends, the ones who did not escape or came back out of loyalty to us. Those tigers in human form have cut their heads from their bodies, torn them limb from limb. Have cut their heads from their bodies, torn them limb from limb. Come, come, my dear, interposed the man, still in a placating voice. We cannot always think of these horrible things. Come, play for me at the clavecin, as of old. Sing to me, my dear. As if from nowhere, an old-fashioned musical instrument, a clavecin or harpsichord, appeared before us. It could not have been there before without being seen, for it was a huge thing on legs, nearly as large as a modern piano. Yet there it was, clearly visible in the wavering grayish light, with a stool before it, at which the elder woman seated herself. As my lips opened in a half-uttered cry of horror, the player began plucking at the strings, and the strangest melodies I had ever heard began coming forth, while she accompanied them in a quivering, sad voice of a subdued loveliness. The music was low, almost ghostly faint, and was charged with such a deep, throbbing sorrow that at the first note the tears began coursing down my cheeks. As the woman went on and on with her song, its melancholy increased, though it still had the same eerily distant quality. It seemed that I was listening to a plaint from across countless years and remotest places. Now everyone in the room appeared to have forgotten my presence. The younger woman, the man, and the girl gathered about the player, as if to drink in every note. Even the small boy arose and joined the group. And as they did so, the light, as if condensed by some unseen reflector, suddenly concentrated upon them, leaving the rest of the room in shadow. And then the illumination, wavering and flickering more than ever, began to dwindle, until suddenly, without warning, it went out, and I found myself in blackness. 
But still, from amid the coaly gloom, that phantom-thin music continued to sound. The voice of the singer blended with the notes of the instrument, unspeakably sad, immensely distant, fading like the wind-borne tones of receding minstrels. Only then did all my concentrated dread and horror find expression in one tremendous scream. Fumbling and groping, somehow I found the door. Somehow I forced my limbs free of the spell that had gripped them, and started down the twisted stairs. And then all at once, everything went blank. When I came to myself, still listening to that sad, faint music, I was lying on a Paris street. The glow of late twilight was in the air. A small crowd had gathered about me. Does this man need help? A voice sympathetically asked. He stumbled and fell, and has been many minutes coming too. No doubt it was only the heat. No doubt, it was the heat, I agreed, as I struggled to my feet. But in my ears that phantom music still made a dismal refrain. The next day, I reported my experience to my friend Jacques Chervier, a student at the Sorbonne, whose specialty was Parisian history. He looked at me sharply as I finished. Just where did you say this happened? I mentioned the exact street location, of which I had taken note after the adventure. So, he answered significantly. So, well, this is strange. Do you know you were walking on the exact site of the old temple? What in thunder was the temple? It was the old castle of the Knights Templar, which was torn down in 1811, at the age of almost 600 years. Torn down in 1811, I repeated dully. It's famous as the scene of many historic episodes, Jacques warmed to his theme, not the least notable being the imprisonment of a king and queen of France, along with their two children, and Madame Elizabeth, the king's sister. That was back in 1792. You know, of course, what king and queen I refer to. I could only mumble something incoherent. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were both lodged there before being sent to the guillotine. The old castle, from all I can make out, was exactly as you have described it, even to the small dog that kept the prisoners company. But that doesn't explain why I, of all persons, and at this particular time... Don't you recall the date? Let's see, today's the 14th, isn't it? And yesterday was the 13th. It was on August 13th, just at about sunset, that Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were imprisoned in the temple. Perhaps every year, on the anniversary of that event. But I did not hear the remainder of Jacques' speech. I was not interested in his explanations. In my ears, a thin, sorrowful music seemed to be playing. I was back in a tower room, in a wavering, fog-gray light, where five shadowy figures were gathered, among them a woman whose deep, pleading, tragic eyes seemed to call and call across an immeasurable gulf. From the way you describe it, Doctor, the Orn place does indeed sound as if it had a poltergeist bouncing around inside it, Thomas Chadwick reflected, turning the nutmeg grounds about in the tumbler in his gaunt, weather-stained hand. Which is, of course, more readily said than settled. For how does one cope with such a critter? Assuming that Eliza Blaine is host, or hostess rather, for this manifestation, should she and it be treated according to the concepts which the psychologists use when they so gingerly deal with such a phenomenon? or in terms of the specialists in psychic affairs. For my part, sir, if I were more deeply involved, I'd try neither, but record any phenomena in simple terms, and try to settle in my own mind enough of their nature to warrant an attempt to break them up. Good, good. Now, can we start from the beginning, with some idea what the term poltergeist means to you? Yes, sometimes strange supernormal happenings occur in the vicinity of an adolescent, which come to be attributed to the operation of an alien power, directing agent, elemental force, or what you will, upon his victim's personality. The picture is that of a hermit crab in the shell of a periwinkle, only here the same skull quarters are shared simultaneously by an alternately dominant and dormant power and victim. The psychologist is on a spot, since this setup would be duck soup for a Freudian explanation if it weren't for the recorded hell-raisings outside of the subject's accomplishments, such unaccountable but recurrent pranks as a deluge of stones, strange peltings which explain the German name poltergeist, pelting ghost, and a variety of caprices worthy of a puck or a kobold. 
I refilled Chadwick's glass and my own, taking the hot water with which to dilute the rum from a kettle in a chimney niche built a century back for this purpose. But the hell of it is, the symptoms are external to the subject, Chadwick argued, and the creditability of such evidence must be tested before we can establish a satisfactory attitude regarding the poltergeist. I was just agreeing with my elderly friend when a car's headlight swept Chadwick's window. That's probably Oliver Orne now, I commented, going to the door. Orne was a strong, wiry man in his late forties. He greeted Chadwick and explained that he had learned of my whereabouts from the switchboard operator, who habitually rerouted the calls of my practice at my request. Mr. Chadwick and I were just talking about your ward's case. He has lived and worked in many parts of the world, and exercised common sense on plenty of problems which would stump a young country doctor like myself. Chadwick cut my eulogy with an epithet of mock contempt and turned inquiringly to Orne. Well, what I came for is this. Eliza went up to bed about nine, while my wife and I sat in the kitchen listening to the radio. Just after Eliza went upstairs, the radio began to static badly, so I turned it off. I went on reading the newspaper, but noticed that everything was real quiet, the sounds Eliza made getting ready for bed sounding miles away. Suddenly she screamed. Then we heard scraping noises, ending in a loud crash. I ran upstairs as fast as I could and found the kid fainted across her bed, with all the furniture drawn in a heap around her. The dresser, chairs, the heavy linen chest. I don't see how it happened. We sat quietly for a minute or so, then he turned to me. Dr. Huntley, I want you to come stay with us until we can find some way to stop these goings-on. Why, I'd be glad to, only I don't know about such things. Doctors don't... Perhaps we can find some psychologist, I stammered. No, I don't want an outsider, Orne replied. Maybe we can cook up some arrangement for you to stay at the house without arousing any suspicion. That would be best. After some discussion, I agreed to this arrangement, with the excuse that repairs to my house made boarding out easier for me. As I could promise no results, I made my fee low, and only chargeable if something favorable were achieved. So that evening, I started a case daybook, carefully avoiding technical terms which would influence diagnosis. I give you herewith an abridged version of the case history, day by day. Disturbance at the Orn Place June 3rd, 1949. The homestead is a two and a half story frame building with an L, a typical New England farmhouse. Built a century and a half ago, it appears to be in sound condition. The hand hewed timbers, tenon and mortise and trunnel fitted, the pine paneling throughout downstairs acknowledge this antiquity and conceivably help provide whatever susceptibility may be needed for psychic manifestations. It is neither extremely isolated nor otherwise though it would appear so to a city dweller, for 75 yards separated from the nearest neighbors. The location on the edge of Whitaker Intervale, against the wooded slopes of Dawn Mountain, would be agreeable, though lonely in winter, when the sun goes down early in the afternoon. Anne Orne, Oliver's wife, is a small, energetic woman who does a great deal of work, though with all the stir of a wren in a dust bath. Oliver also is a worker, running his own extensive farm, and hiring out with his tractor and other farm and lumbering machinery. Eliza Blaine is an attractive, well-bred girl of 15, with large brown eyes and brown hair. Judging by her voice and manners, she would appear to be of an even, genial disposition, without perceptible neurotic tendencies, surely. She had been adopted the summer before, following the death of her father, a distant relative of Mrs. Orne. Before coming to Whitaker Intervale, she had lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where her father had given her a number of benefits in education and upbringing. The first occurrence prior to my arrival at the Orne Place was in April. Eliza had just bidden her foster parents good night at the door leading from the kitchen which shuts off the back stairs and prevents drafts from dispelling the heat in winter. Oliver saw the door shut and heard the girl's footsteps ascending the stairs. Then, half a beat behind them, another footstep started up. Eliza was nearly at the top of the stairs before Oliver gathered his wits and opened the door. She was alone there, turning to look down at him beneath the bare light bulb. Her face wore a strange, devilish smile, compounded of mockery, yet fearfully, terribly alien. Oliver stood dumbfounded, turning over in his mind whether Eliza had somehow prankishly skipped upstairs, but was unable to fit this deviltry with her character. 
So he ended up staring gape-jawed until she turned, snapping off the light and proceeding in the dark to the next light switch just inside her room. When Oliver turned back into the kitchen, his wife looked up nonplussed from her darning. Their discussion made no headway with the matter, partly perhaps since Oliver somehow omitted telling his wife of Eliza's strange expression. They concluded that this might have been a freak of sound involving the wood frame of the house and called to mind reports of similar happenings. In the latter part of May, on a rainy afternoon, the minister, Mr. Brainerd, came to call. Mrs. Orne was in the kitchen frying donuts, while Eliza was washing clothes, using set tubs and a washing machine in the L, also connected to the kitchen by a door. Mrs. Orne naturally exclaimed regarding the condition of the house, her hair, and dress, while Mr. Brainerd climbed from his car. Nevertheless, after shedding these fluttering preliminaries of a parishional call, she had settled Mr. Brainerd, a young, easygoing fellow, over coffee, fresh donuts, and discreet gossip. He sat facing the open L door, where Eliza was continuing her work. His coffee cup was halfway to his lips, which were pursed with intent to retract if the liquid proved too hot, when a cake of soap floated through the air, coming from the L and swinging in a near 90-degree arc to settle in the soap dish by the kitchen sink. That was one cup of coffee Mr. Brainerd did not drink. Several minutes later, when Mr. Brainerd and Ann Orne looked into the L, they found Eliza caught by nervous laughter, badly convulsed, apparently from the effort of her performance. Indeed, the two mystified witnesses had to put her on the front room couch and minister to her with damp cloths, smelling salts, or whatever they thought best. There was no trace of the diabolical about her expression then. On recovering, she claimed she knew nothing of the episode, being quite unable to explain her attack of hysteria. With this episode, the story took form and spread through the community. I was called in, though my examination brought nothing positive to light. For the record, the story that the donuts in the bowl on the kitchen table flew onto the coat hangers against the kitchen wall is the invention and whole cloth embroidery of some absent party, a village loafer probably, for both Mr. Brainerd and Ann Orne deny any such occurrence. June 6, 1949. In return for a couple of weeks with a limited practice, I had to put in more time at the hospital. Evenings were more apt to be free, and so far I have managed to be on hand most evenings, though nothing has yet happened during my stay. This evening, the four of us were seated at the table reading, or in Eliza's case, writing a letter to a friend in Portsmouth. A mouse had been scampering in the walls, though I had not been particularly conscious of it until I happened to notice Eliza reflecting a moment over her letter. I could almost see her attention caught by the creature's slight scuttlings and squeakings. Perhaps a sudden muffling of the atmosphere was responsible, as if a focus of attention of some sort were being established. Then, all at once, Eliza's face changed, taking on the wholly tense, preoccupied expression of a cat about to spring. A full, taut minute thus, and then she gave a slight forward thrust, just the shadow of a lunge, I would call it. From the wall, a shrill, agonized mouse cry piped. The Orns looked up in surprise at the blank wall and its hidden, strangely racked victim. Neither Eliza nor I turned a heeding head, I, of course, being concerned with her reaction. While she... Well, I think I must yield my medical judgment and say she acted as one possessed, as if the person within her personality were supplanted, her mind being temporarily tenanted by a diabolical force. No, this poltergeist is no mere prankster's connivance. A moment following the mouse's last cry, soon reached in rapid diminuendo, Eliza thrust the very tip of her tongue briefly between her teeth, and in doing so seemed to be released to herself and regain her own personality. Seeing the three of us watching her, rather than the blank wall behind which was a still mouse, she shook her head slightly. Gosh, I must have dozed off. I feel awfully tired. I didn't snore, did I? I assured her that she hadn't, that we were merely looking up because we thought we had heard a mouse in the wall. Yes, I guess I must have heard him scampering around. Funny, you hear a noise like that and hardly realize it. Shortly after that, she retired for the night. June 7th, 1949. I've been thinking a good deal today about the human brain as an organ. Now the heart is fairly plainly a pump, one can comprehend its function upon inspecting it, as in dissection. And so on with all the other organs, their functions can be readily comprehended upon examination. 
But the mass of gray matter which comprises the brain cannot be thus comprehended as the source of thought process. One cannot see where or how this visceral-like mass permits one to pilot an airplane and carry on a conversation at the same time, or to cope with a novel problem such as the present one of conjecture concerning poltergeists. Since we cannot yet look into the brain and get very far by induction, all we know about it is what we feel and experience ourselves, or what we observe in others. Therefore, I conclude, if phenomenal accomplishments are directed by the brain, of which the brain's possessor is wholly unaware, the fact that these functions were directed by the brain would defy detection. Thus, for example, the recent experiments at Duke University with cards regarding mental telegraphy, or the age-old business of making a divining rod to indicate the subterranean presence of water, these in the human brain, or the homing instinct in the pigeon's brain, suggest that certain functions of the brain may exceed anything we have yet ascertained. Putting it another way, if we say, I think, therefore I am, the I am cannot directly challenge or enlarge upon the I think. And if an unaccounted relationship between forces of the mind and external objects, and conjecturably forces in the environment exist, there's simply no telling of it. June 11, 1949. Whatever it is, it's getting stronger, growing like a malignant tumor. Each successful exercise of dominance over Eliza's mind increases the power of the next manifestation, which may be less capricious and not content with a mouse for a victim. That Eliza is possessed by a malevolent entity or grotesque preternatural schism of split personality, or whatever in hell it can be called, for it is surely spawned of hell, is apparent to me, whether my terms fit the textbooks or not. Eliza and I started the evening with a game of checkers. This would prove diverting while keeping me posted on her mental state. She sat in the chair Reverend Brainerd had occupied, facing the L, the kitchen sink, this is from the chair occupants left to right, a window into the area of front yard, which might be called the L courtyard. We played across a corner of the full-size table in order to reach the board readily. Her game was undistinguished and free from devious tricks or wild gambles. My own is orthodox, too. I'm merely noting the less artful nature of this girl of half my age. Her chance came in the third game to force me to sacrifice, if she could be reasonably sure of her calculations. As she concentrated on the alternative moves, I watched her, though in a moment she screened her brow with her hand, and I could no longer see her face. Suddenly the air became heavy, a stillness that almost seemed sound ensued, as if silent black wings beat down upon the air. The telephone went ting, not ringing, but ticking, as these country lines do in a thunderstorm. I looked up at the windows, wondering if a storm was coming, but could see only darkness. Then I saw a face pressed against the L courtyard window, a white face, wide-eyed in terror. It was the face of Eliza Blaine. Breaking my gaze from this onlookers, I turned in amazement to the girl across the checkerboard. Her face was utterly alien, an abominable satyr's mask, looking in cool, sardonic amusement at its counterpart's features pressed so fearfully against the window pane. I think that I did the right thing at last. I ran to the outer L door and threw it open upon the courtyard. Switching on the outdoor light, I saw the courtyard was empty and the impress of no footprints were in the garden plot under the window. I turned back at once to find Oliver Orne just catching the fainting Eliza. I think I did right, I say, because if I had turned and slapped the face or shaken the shoulders of the creature across the checkerboard from me, there'd be danger of psychic trauma for Eliza, with negative results as far as the poltergeist went. June 12th, 1949. This morning I visited Chadwick, telling him what appears here. His advice to me was, Your best bet is to find some action which will fit all the various theories about poltergeists, since you are concerned with sure counteraction rather than theorizing. You must apply this action when the poltergeist is dominant, and in such a way that Eliza is done neither bodily nor mental harm. You must surprise the poltergeist, confronting him as strongly as possible at the moment of his greatest aggression, and you must do so with something as opposite in all respects as possible. I agreed, and we concocted, rejected, and sorted over a number of possible plans. Finally, we hit upon two or three schemes which seem more substantial, if they can be worked out. I do not propose to report on them now, as they may never be tested, since one of them involved the services of a skilled dental technician friend 
I spent the rest of the day with him in the hospital laboratory. June 15, 1949 Fortunately, no manifestations took place while I was completing a variety of preparations to cover as many contingencies as I could. Today, I brought back the acrylic plastic candlestick, which my dental technician had produced, using his false teeth manufacture thus divertedly. It was a curious piece, anything but artistic, with shapeless, top-heavy bulges. Remarking upon its amateurish appearance and saying that I could do better with more practice, I put the object on the mantle with my tobacco jar and smoking apparatus. Since it seemed highly improbable that the poltergeist would appear in the presence of any object which it knew to be inimical, I hoped that this candlestick would not appear so. It had been a hot day, with thunder showers likely to break the oppressively muggy air. Shortly after supper, I was standing up, filling my pipe, as is my custom. I was reaching for a wooden match from the wall receptacle and idly looking into the mirror in front of me. My gaze rested on the image of Eliza, or what displaced it. The face was turned as she talked to Mrs. Orne, but the mirror reflected the abhorrent satyr's head, self-confident with the myriad abominations of hell itself. As I watched, Eliza, or this horror, saw me staring at the mirror and broke into a Sardonian smile. I turned from the mirror to Eliza. Her features were nearly normal, though the alterations were even now taking place, as if challenging me for my looking-glass view. I was not idle either, for the time had come. And yet my mind continued turning over the matter of mirrors, the lore of the speculum of Mage Merlin, the devil's looking-glass of Dr. Lee, of catoptromancy and vampirism. I had picked up the candlestick and advanced slowly, with a show of irresolution, to the stove. Doctors and acrobats, bullfighters and actors, must have a sense of timing. It is often extremely important. Here, the poltergeist must think me uncertain, or bent upon hurting Eliza, at which misdirected aim he could laugh, exult, and grow stronger. So I advanced to the stove as the transformation, unabated, reached its completion. Mr. and Mrs. Orne sat still, as I lifted the lid of the hot kettle. I had to trust them to heed my injunction not to stir. Then the lights went out. The electricity in this part of the country sometimes does cut out when there are thunderstorms, but this was too opportune to be chance. From Eliza's figure sprouted mushroom blobs of static light, like St. Elmo's fires, shining yet not igniting, forming at the hem of her skirt, her waist, the nape of her neck, swamp fire of the fiend's finding. With the room thus weirdly illumined, the poltergeist held both hands aloft with palms taut and fingers radiating, outstretched to the area above my head. Shrilly, Eliza's strained vocal cords emitted the fiend's curses and evocations. All around me stones fell, yet I was unhurt. I drew from the kettle the acrylic plastic figure. The action of the boiling water had fulfilled our anticipations, by invoking the peculiar properties of the candlestick's substances, reshaping it into the form of a crucifix. As I walked forward with the talisman upraised, the demonic creature emitted a hell-rending cry as if a bottomless pit gaped beneath him. His hands lowered spasmodically to clutch idiotically about his face. His features withered and writhed, revealed as the electricity came on again, when presumably the fiend's willpower dissolved its damning block. In a moment, the struggle was over. Eliza, released, collapsed into her chair, and but for my free hand would have fallen to the floor. June 15, 1949. Chadwick explains the matter by calling the poltergeist a virulent mass and the crucifix an all-healing antibiotic, which is an interesting way of putting it. Since the crucifix was dormant in the plastic, the acrylic being peculiar in that once fixed, in the form of a crucifix, it could be provisionally altered to the rough shape of a candlestick until its memory was stirred by the boiling water. When it reverted to its fixed shape, it could form a perfect opposite to the poltergeist. Within the last eight years, the precise date I purposely omit, I was ordered by my physician, my health being in an unsatisfactory state, to change my residence to one upon the seacoast, 
and accordingly I took a house for a year in a fashionable watering place, at a moderate distance from the city in which I had previously resided, and connected with it by a railway. Winter was setting in when my removal thither was decided upon, but there was nothing whatever dismal or depressing in the change. The house I had taken was to all appearance, and in point of convenience too, quite a modern one. It formed one in a cheerful row, with small gardens in front facing the sea, and commanding sea air and sea views and perfection. In the rear it had a coach house and stable, and between them and the house a considerable grass plot with some flower beds interposed. Our family consisted of my wife and myself, with three children, the eldest about nine years old, she and the next in age being girls, and the youngest, between six and seven, a boy. To these were added six servants, whom, although for certain reasons I declined giving their real names, I shall indicate for the sake of clearness by arbitrary ones. There was a nurse, Mrs. Sutherland, a nursery maid, Mary Page, the cook, Mrs. Greenwood, and the housemaid, Ellen Faith, a butler, whom I shall call Smith, and his son James, about two and twenty. We came out to take possession at about seven o'clock in the evening. Everything was comfortable and cheery, good fires lighted, the rooms neat and airy, and a general air of preparation and comfort, highly conducive to good spirits and pleasant anticipations. The sitting rooms were large and cheerful, and they in the bedrooms more than ordinarily lofty. The kitchen and servants' rooms on the same level were well and comfortably furnished, and had, like the rest of the house, an air of recent painting and fitting up and a completely modern character, which imparted a very cheerful air of cleanliness and convenience. There had been just enough of the fuss of settling agreeably to occupy us, and to give a pleasant turn to our thoughts after we had retired to our rooms. Being an invalid, I had a small bed to myself, resigning the four-poster to my wife. The candle was extinguished, but a nightlight was burning. I was coming upstairs, and she, already in bed, had just dismissed her maid, when we were both startled by a wild scream from her room, I found her in a state of the extremest agitation and terror. She insisted that she had seen an unnaturally tall figure come beside her bed and stand there. The light was too faint to enable her to define anything respecting this apparition, beyond the fact of her having most distinctly seen such a shape, colorless from the insufficiency of the light to disclose more than its dark outline. We both endeavored to reassure her, the room once more looked so cheerful in the candlelight that we were quite uninfluenced by the contagion of her terrors. The movements and voices of the servants downstairs, still getting things into their places and completing our comfortable arrangements, had also their effect in stealing us against any such influence, and we set the whole thing down as a dream, or an imperfectly seen outline of the bed curtains. When, however, we were alone, my wife reiterated, still in great agitation, her clear assertion that she had most positively seen, being at the time as completely awake as she ever was, precisely what she had described to us, and in this conviction she continued perfectly firm. A day or two after this, it came out that our servants were under an apprehension that somehow or other, thieves had established a secret mode of access to the lower part of the house. The butler, Smith, had seen an ill-looking woman in his room on the first night of our arrival, and he and other servants constantly saw, for many days subsequently, glimpses of a retreating figure, which corresponded with that so seen by him, passing through a passage which led to a back area in which were some coal vaults. This figure was seen always in the act of retreating, its back turned, generally getting round the corner of the passage into the area in a stealthy and hurried way, and when closely followed, imperfectly seen again entering one of the coal vaults, and when pursued into it, nowhere to be found. The idea of anything supernatural in the matter had, strange to say, not yet entered the mind of any one of the servants. They had heard some stories of smugglers having secret passages into houses, and using their means of access for purposes of pillage, or with a view to frighten superstitious people out of houses which they needed for their own objects, and a suspicion of similar practices here caused them extreme uneasiness. The apparent anxiety also manifested by this retreating figure to escape observation, and her always appearing to make her egress at the same point, favored this romantic hypothesis. The men, however, made a most careful examination of the back area and of the coal vaults, with a view to discover some mode of egress, but entirely without success. On the contrary, the result was, so far as it went, subversive of the theory, 
Solid masonry met them on every hand. I called the man, Smith, up to hear from his own lips the particulars of what he had seen, and certainly his report was very curious. I give it as literally as my memory enables me. His son slept in the same room and was sound asleep, but he lay awake, as men sometimes will on a change of bed and having many things on his mind. He was lying with his face towards the wall, but observing a light and some little stir in the room, he turned round in his bed and saw the figure of a woman, squalid and ragged in dress, her figure rather low and broad, as well as I recollect she had something, either a cloak or a shawl on, and wore a bonnet. Her back was turned, and she appeared to be searching or rummaging for something on the floor, and without appearing to observe him, she turned in doing so towards him. The light, which was more like the intense glow of a coal, as he described it, being of a deep red color, proceeded from the hollow of her hand, which she held beside her head, and he saw her perfectly distinctly. She appeared middle-aged, was deeply pitted with the smallpox, and blind in one eye. His phrase in describing her general appearance was that she was a miserable, poor-looking creature. He was under the impression that she must be the woman who had been left by the proprietor in charge of the house, and who had that evening, after having given up the keys, remained for some little time with the female servants. He coughed, therefore, to apprise her of his presence, and turned again towards the wall. When he again looked round, she and the light were gone, and odd as was her method of lighting herself in her search, the circumstances excited neither uneasiness nor curiosity in his mind until he discovered next morning that the woman in question had left the house long before he had gone to bed. I examined the man very closely as to the appearance of the person who had visited him, and the result was what I have described. It struck me as an odd thing that even then, considering how prone to superstition persons in his rank of life usually are, he did not seem to suspect anything supernatural in the occurrence, and on the contrary, was thoroughly persuaded that his visitant was a living person who had got into the house by some hidden entrance. On Sunday, on his return from his place of worship, he told me that when the service was ended and the congregation making their way slowly out, he saw the very woman in the crowd and kept his eye upon her for several minutes, but such was the crush that all his efforts to reach her were unavailing, and when he got into the open street she was gone. He was quite positive as to having distinctly seen her, however, for several minutes, and scouted the possibility of any mistake as to identity. And fully impressed with the substantial and living reality of his visitant, he was very much provoked at her having escaped him. He made inquiries also in the neighborhood, but could procure no information, nor hear of any other persons having seen any woman corresponding with his visitant. The cook and the housemaid occupied a bedroom on the kitchen floor, it had whitewashed walls, and they were actually terrified by the appearance of the shadow of a woman passing and repassing across the side wall opposite to their beds. They suspected that this had been going on much longer than they were aware, for its presence was discovered by a sort of accident, its movements happening to take a direction in distinct opposition to theirs. This shadow always moved upon one particular wall, returning after short intervals and causing them extreme terror. They placed the candle, as the most obvious specific, so close to the infested wall that the flame all but touched it, and believed for some time that they had effectually got rid of this annoyance. But one night, notwithstanding this arrangement of the light, the shadow returned, passing and repassing as heretofore, upon the same wall, although their only candle was burning within an inch of it, and it was obvious that no substance capable of casting such a shadow could have interposed. And indeed, as they described it, the shadow seemed to have no sort of relation to the position of the light, and appeared, as I have said, in manifest defiance of the laws of optics. I ought to mention that the housemaid was a particularly fearless sort of person, as well as a very honest one, and her companion, the cook, a scrupulously religious woman, and both agreed in every particular in their relation of what occurred. Meanwhile, the nursery was not without its annoyances, though as yet of a comparatively trivial kind. Sometimes, at night, the handle of the door was turned hurriedly, as if by a person trying to come in, and at others a knocking was made at it. These sounds occurred after the children had settled to sleep, and while the nurse still remained awake. Whenever she called to ask who was there, the sounds ceased, but several times, and particularly at first, she was under the impression that they were caused by her mistress, 
who would come to see the children, and thus impressed, she had got up and opened the door, expecting to see her, but discovering only darkness and receiving no answer to her inquiries. With respect to this nurse, I must mention that I believe no more perfectly trustworthy servant was ever employed in her capacity, and, in addition to her integrity, she was remarkably gifted with sound common sense. One morning, I think about three or four weeks after our arrival, I was sitting at the parlor window which looked to the front, when I saw the little iron door which admitted into the small garden that lay between the window where I was sitting and the public road, pushed open by a woman who so exactly answered the description given by Smith of the woman who had visited his room on the night of his arrival, as instantaneously to impress me with the conviction that she must be the identical person. She was a square, short woman, dressed in soiled and tattered clothes, scarred and pitted with smallpox, and blind in one eye. She stepped hurriedly into the little enclosure, and peered from a distance of a few yards into the room where I was sitting. I felt that now was the moment to clear the matter up, but there was something stealthy in the manner and look of the woman, which convinced me that I must not appear to notice her until her retreat was fairly cut off. Unfortunately, I was suffering from a lame foot, and could not reach the bell as quickly as I wished. I made all the haste I could, and rang violently to bring up the servant, Smith. In the short interval that intervened, I observed the woman from the window, who having in a leisurely way, and with a kind of scrutiny, looked along the front windows of the house, passed quickly out again, closing the gate after her, and followed a lady who was walking along the footpath at a quick pace, as if with the intention of begging from her. The moment the man entered, I told him, the blind woman you described to me has this instant followed a lady in that direction. Try to overtake her. He was, if possible, more eager than I in the chase, but returned in a short time after a vain pursuit, very hot and utterly disappointed. And thereafter, we saw her face no more. All this time, and up to the period of our leaving the house, which was not for two or three months later, there occurred at intervals the only phenomenon in the entire series having any resemblance to what we here describe as spiritualism. This was a knocking, like a soft hammering with a wooden mallet, as it seemed in the timbers between the bedroom ceilings and the roof. It had this special peculiarity that it was always rhythmical, and, I think invariably, the emphasis upon the last stroke. It would sound rapidly, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four or one, two, three, one, two, three, and sometimes one, two, one, two, etc., and this with intervals and resumptions monotonously for hours at a time. At first, this caused my wife, who was a good deal confined to her bed, much annoyance, and we sent to our neighbors to inquire if any hammering or carpentering was going on in their houses, but were informed that nothing of the sort was taking place. I have myself heard it frequently, always in the same inaccessible part of the house, and with the same monotonous emphasis. One odd thing about it was, that on my wife's calling out, as she used to do when it became more than usually troublesome, stop that noise, it was invariably arrested for a longer or shorter time. Of course, none of these occurrences were ever mentioned in hearing of the children. They would have been, no doubt, like most children, greatly terrified had they heard anything of the matter and known that their elders were unable to account for what was passing, and their fears would have made them wretched and troublesome. They used to play for some hours every day in the back garden, the house forming one end of this oblong enclosure, the stable and coach house the other, and two parallel walls of considerable height the sides. Here, as it afforded a perfectly safe playground, they were frequently left quite to themselves, and in talking over their day's adventures, as children will, they happened to mention a woman, or rather the woman, for they had long grown familiar with her appearance, whom they used to see in the garden while they were at play. They assumed that she came in and went out at the stable door, but they never actually saw her enter or depart. They merely saw a figure, that of a very poor woman, soiled and ragged, near the stable wall, stooping over the ground, and apparently grubbing in the loose clay in search of something. She did not disturb or appear to observe them, and they left her in undisturbed possession of her nook of ground. When seen, it was always in the same spot, and similarly occupied, and the description they gave of her general appearance, for they never saw her face, corresponded with that of the one-eyed woman whom Smith, and subsequently as it seemed, I had seen. 
The other man, James, who looked after a mare which I had purchased for the purpose of riding exercise, had, like everyone else in the house, his little trouble to report, though it was not much. The stall in which, as the most comfortable, it was decided to place her, she peremptorily declined to enter. Though a very docile and gentle little animal, there was no getting her into it. She would snort and rear, and in fact do or suffer anything rather than set her hoof in it. He was compelled, therefore, to place her in another. And on several occasions he found her there, exhibiting all the equine symptoms of extreme fear. Like the rest of us, however, this man was not troubled in the particular case with any superstitious qualms. The mare had evidently been frightened, and he was puzzled to find out how or by whom, for the stable was well secured, and had, I am nearly certain, a lock-up yard outside. One morning I was greeted with the intelligence that robbers had certainly got into the house in the night, and that one of them had actually been seen in the nursery. The witness, I found, was my eldest child, then, as I have said, about nine years of age. Having awoke in the night, and lain awake for some time in her bed, she heard the handle of the door turn, and a person whom she distinctly saw, for it was a light night and the window shutters unclosed, but whom she had never seen before, stepped in on tiptoe and with an appearance of great caution. He was a rather small man with a very red face. He wore an oddly cut frock coat, the collar of which stood up, and trousers, rough and wide, like those of a sailor, turned up at the ankles, and either short boots or clumsy shoes, covered with mud. This man listened beside the nurse's bed, which stood next to the door, as if to satisfy himself that she was sleeping soundly, and having done so for some seconds, he began to move cautiously in a diagonal line, across the room to the chimney piece, where he stood for a while, and so resumed his tiptoe walk, skirting the wall, until he reached a chest of drawers, some of which were open, and into which he looked, and began to rummage in a hurried way, as the child supposed, making search for something worth taking away. He then passed on to the window, where there was a dressing table, at which he also stopped, turning over the things upon it, and standing for some time at the window as if looking out, and then resuming his walk by the side wall opposite to that by which he had moved up to the window, he returned in the same way toward the nurse's bed, so as to reach it at the foot. With its side to the end wall, in which was the door, was placed the little bed in which lay my eldest child, who watched his proceedings with the extremest terror. As he drew near, she instinctively moved herself in the bed, with her head and shoulders to the wall, drawing up her feet, but he passed by without appearing to observe, or at least to care for her presence. Immediately after, the nurse turned in her bed, as if about to waken, and when the child, who had drawn the clothes about her head, again ventured to peep out, the man was gone. The child had no idea of her having seen anything more formidable than a thief. With the prowling, cautious, and noiseless manner of proceeding common to such marauders, the air and movements of the man whom she had seen entirely corresponded. And on hearing her perfectly distinct and consistent account, I could myself arrive at no other conclusion than that a stranger had actually got into the house. I had, therefore, in the first instance, a most careful examination made to discover any traces of an entrance having been made by any window into the house. The doors had been found barred and locked as usual, but no sign of anything of the sort was discernible. I then had the various articles, plate, wearing apparel, books, etc., counted, and after having conned over and reckoned up everything, it became quite clear that nothing whatever had been removed from the house nor was there the slightest indication of anything having been so much as disturbed there. I must here state that this child was remarkably clear, intelligent, and observant, and that her description of the man, and of all that had occurred, was most exact, and as detailed as the want of perfect light rendered possible. I felt assured that an entrance had actually been effected into the house, though for what purpose was not easily to be conjectured. The man Smith was equally confident upon this point, and his theory was that the object was simply to frighten us out of the house by making us believe it haunted, and he was more than ever anxious and on the alert to discover the conspirators. It often since appeared to me odd, every year indeed more odd, as this cumulative case of the marvelous becomes to my mind more and more inexplicable, that underlying my sense of mystery and puzzle was all along the quiet assumption that all these occurrences were, one way or another, referable to natural causes. I could not account for them, indeed, myself, but during the whole period I inhabited that house, I never once felt, though much alone, and often up very late at night, 
any of those tremors and thrills which everyone has at times experienced when situation and the hour are favorable. Except the cook and housemaid, who were plagued with the shadow I mentioned crossing and recrossing upon the bedroom wall, we all, without exception, experienced the same strange sense of security and rendered these phenomena rather with a perplexed sort of interest and curiosity than with any more unpleasant sensations. The knockings which I have mentioned at the nursery door, preceded generally by the sound of a step on the lobby, meanwhile continued. At that time, for my wife, like myself, was an invalid, two eminent physicians, who came out occasionally by rail, were attending us. These gentlemen were at first only amused, but ultimately interested, and very much puzzled by the occurrences which we described. One of them at last recommended that a candle should be kept burning in the lobby. It was, in fact, a recurrence to an old woman's recipe against ghosts. Of course, it might be serviceable, too, against impostors. At all events, seeming, as I have said, very much interested and puzzled, he advised it, and it was tried. We fancied that it was successful, for there was an interval of quiet for, I think, three or four nights. But after that, the noises, the footsteps in the lobby, the knocking at the door, and the turning of the handle recommenced in full force notwithstanding the light upon the table outside, and these particular phenomena became only more perplexing than ever. The alarm of robbers and smugglers gradually subsided after a week or two, but we were again to hear news from the nursery. Our second little girl, then between seven and eight years of age, saw in the nighttime, she alone being awake, a young woman with black or very dark hair which hung loose, and with a black cloak on, standing near the middle of the floor, opposite the hearthstone, and fronting the foot of her bed. She appeared quite unobservant of the children and nurse sleeping in the room. She was very pale, and looked, the child said, both sorry and frightened, and with something very peculiar and terrible about her eyes, which made the child conclude that she was dead. She was looking, not at, but in the direction of the child's bed, and there was a dark streak across her throat, like a scar with blood upon it. This figure was not motionless, but once or twice turned slowly, and without appearing to be conscious of the presence of the child or the other occupants of the room, like a person in vacancy or abstraction. There was on this occasion a nightlight burning in the chamber, and the child saw, or thought she saw, all these particulars with the most perfect distinctness. She got her head under the bedclothes, and although a good many years have passed since then, she cannot recall the spectacle without feelings of peculiar horror." One day, when the children were playing in the back garden, I asked them to point out to me the spot where they were accustomed to see the woman who occasionally showed herself, as I have described, near the stable wall. There was no division of opinion as to this precise point, which they indicated in the most distinct and confident way. I suggested that perhaps something might be hidden there in the ground, and advised them digging a hole there with their little spades to try for it. Accordingly, to work they went and by my return in the evening they had grubbed up a piece of a jawbone with several teeth in it. The bone was very much decayed and ready to crumble to pieces, but the teeth were quite sound. I could not tell whether they were human grinders, but I showed the fossil to one of the physicians I have mentioned, who came out the next evening, and he pronounced them human teeth. The same conclusion was to come a day or two later by the other medical man. It appears to me now, on reviewing the whole matter, almost unaccountable, that with such evidence before me, I should not have got in a laborer and have the spot effectually dug and searched. I can only say that so it was. I was quite satisfied of the moral truth of every word that had been related to me, and which I have here set down with scrupulous accuracy. But I experienced an apathy, for which neither then nor afterwards did I quite know how to account. I had a vague but immovable impression that the whole affair was referable to natural agencies. It was not until some time after we had left the house, which, by the by, we afterwards found had had the reputation of being haunted before we had come to live in it, that on reconsideration I discovered the serious difficulty of accounting satisfactorily for all that had occurred upon ordinary principles. A great deal we might arbitrarily set down to imagination— but even in so doing, there was the oddity, not to say improbability, of so many different persons having nearly simultaneously suffered from different spectral and other illusions during the short period for which we had occupied the house, who never before, so far as we learned, afterwards were troubled by any fears or fancies of the sort. 
There were other things, too, not to be so accounted for. The odd knockings in the roof I frequently heard myself. There were also, which I before forgot to mention, in the daytime, rappings at the doors of the sitting rooms, which constantly deceived us, and it was not till our come-in was unanswered, and the hall or passage outside the door was discovered to be empty, that we learned that whatever else caused them, human hands did not. All the persons who reported having seen the different persons or appearances here described by me were just as confident of having literally and distinctly seen them, as I was of having seen the hard-featured woman with the blind eye, so remarkably corresponding with Smith's description. About a week after the discovery of the teeth, which were found, I think, about two feet under the ground, a friend, much advanced in years, and who remembered the town in which we had now taken up our abode for a very long time, happened to pay us a visit. He good-humoredly dismissed the whole thing, but at the same time was evidently curious about it. We might construct a sort of story, said I, and assign to each of the three figures who appeared their respective parts in some dreadful tragedy enacted in this house. The male figure represents the murderer, the ill-looking one-eyed woman his accomplice, who, we will suppose, buried the body where she is now so often seen grubbing in the earth, and where the human teeth and jawbone have so lately been disinterred and the young woman with disheveled tresses, the black cloak, and the bloody scar across her throat, their victim. A difficulty, however, which I cannot get over, exists in the cheerfulness, the great publicity, and the evident very recent date of the house. Why, as to that, said he, the house is not modern. It and those beside it formed an old government store, altered and fitted up recently, as you see. I remember it well in my young days, fifty years ago before the town had grown out in this direction, and a more entirely lonely spot, or one more fitted for the commission of a secret crime, could not have been imagined. I have nothing to add, for very soon after this, my physician pronounced a longer stay unnecessary for my health, and we took our departure for another place of abode. I may add that although I have resided for considerable periods in many other houses, I never experienced any annoyances of a similar kind elsewhere, Neither have I made, stupid dog, you will say, any inquiries respecting either the antecedents or subsequent history of the house in which we made so disturbed a sojourn. I was content with what I knew, and have here related as clearly as I could, and I think it a very pretty puzzle as it stands.'